Welcome back to the Astrophotography Podcast. My name is Steve Malia, and today I have two amazing guests with me. They are the original Blues Brothers of Astrophotography. Um, uh, that was, and that was a name that they gave themselves. No, I agree with it 100%. Uh, I have none other than Evans and Angelos from Pegasus Astro, direct from Greece. We are an international podcast, after all. And they're here to talk to us about Pegasus Astro and imaging and astrophotography and how to make your astrophotography experience and equipment better using Pegasus products. I use Pegasus products. I use them, well, a well, number of years now. I've used Pegasus Astro products ever since we started to sell them uh, here in Canada. And uh, they've continuously improved and added more functionality and new products as as we go. So, uh, Evans, Angelos, welcome to the Astrophotography Podcast, and thank you for being here. Happy again, Steve. We're, we're friends. We've known each other for a little while. Uh, we've been to different events together. We met at NEF. We've been to AIC, and uh, it's been uh, you know a fantastic uh, journey from then to now. Um, but, you know, Pegasus has been around for a lot longer than, than how, how long I've known you guys. Uh, tell us a bit about Pegasus. Why did you guys start Pegasus? We started astrophotography in 2007. Uh, I met Evans at the mountains. Um, back then, the astrophotography was very tough, especially with the accessories and the gear and the mounts. The, there are there was. Uh, a, not very good accessories at the time. No power boxes, no good mounts and cables and stuff like that we have right now. So uh, the power box idea came to my mind to have a box that can supply power and uh, dual heater, uh, PWM uh, uh, to dual bands and to you know, uh, to do automation to all this stuff and to solve all these disconnections and all the problems with the USB connectivity and stuff like that. So at the start, I made the suitcase with uh, a lot of uh, different PSUs inside with holes on its. Uh, uh, side with different uh, outputs and connectors so it was the first power box back at 2007 2008 uh, and uh, Evan saw that idea and he came with another power box he stole my idea <laughs> he did a, a smaller enclosure with a fancy screen and a humidity and temperature sensor. So I told him to make a company to, you know, to produce this product because our friends saw all this stuff we made back then and they wanted to, to reproduce for them also. So Pegasus also came from, uh, from uh, different problems we had in, the, in this copy because we solved a lot of problems and Pegasus Astro uh, company came from uh, from that. So the power box was the first real yeah, the, device. The, the second one was uh, the D DMFC, the dual motor focus controller with a motor. I remember that. Because uh, if you remember, there, there was only the robot focus back then and light focusers that uh, the cost was very high, 600 and 1,700 and prices like that. So we did uh, our first motorized uh, focuser that was also powerful and it was cheaper and smaller than we the, the focus tube came up with all the electronics without the external controller. So you had an enclosure with all electronics inside this box, this small box. And you only want to put a power supply and a USB and 
it was ready to go. So, so Pegasus and, is both yourself, Angelus, and, and Evans, and, and it's the ingenious design, electronics design that comes together. Evans, you do the electronic side of it. Is that correct? And, and Angelus, you do the actual hardware mechanical design of, of the product. So the two of you come together, right? And, and you, you say, okay, I designed the box and you have to stuff everything into here. That's all the space you get, right? Yeah. So every, what was the first thing you developed then from that? Well, I need I need to cover it also that it's not a dummy, you know, the dummy box. You know, the hard, the the software also is uh, is a part of the box. And nowadays, if if the software is not good, the device is not good either. So the software plays a significant role to the to the uh, to the reputation of the of, of its of its product. So we we are, we are also working on the software. Yeah, and, and that's not just the software that you have installed on a computer or uh, an indie device or or, or similar. It, it it's a software, the development of the software inside the actual equipment itself, so that it it does what it's supposed to efficiently, and, and it it just works. So it'll self correct if it needed to. It can it can read from various sensors, report back, right? There, or is there more to it than than that? I'm I don't want to simplify it. Well, the software. Well, the software I can say has uh, is divided into categories, right? The firmware, the actual firmware of the device that uh, lives inside the device and do all the basic operations, and the software that works in different kind of operating systems. Uh, in terms of uh, of Windows, we have our now we have our Unity platform which works with Astro. But it's not only that, as you said, you need, you need to write also drivers for, for Indie, for Indigo. Now we have Alpaca, uh, maybe OSX, some, some drivers for, for macOS uh, or, or software for macOS. So you need to support nowadays lots of platforms uh, independently. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, not only, it's not only for our platform or only the firmware of the device, but lots of other things that we need to, to, to take care of. Yeah, you, you bring up an interesting point, especially you mentioned Alpaca, and I want to talk about that a little bit later. But let's go back to the products for a second. So we have the Power Box, which is now uh, in, in its commercial version, version 3, right, which is packed with do control, USB control, step motor control, power control, um, environmental sensing, right? Wi-Fi, it, it, it's all there. Fantastic device. It's been, been very popular. Um, focusers, obviously, you have the, the from the DMFC and the Focus Motor to the Focus Cube 3 now, which has some advanced features in it as well. Um, you have the flat panels, you have the mount, right? The NYX 101. And at NIF, you, you launched or you showed off the, the smaller version, the, the NYX 8. Yes, it's the, it's the NYX 88. 88, that's it. Yeah, 88. So... It's a smaller uh, mount, a lower class, uh, smaller payload. Class. The the one one is the diameter of the RA and deck axis. The same for the eighty eight. Okay, okay. So so what's on the eighty eight? What is the payload capacity of the eighty eight? Next eighty eight. It's it's close to up up to uh, sixteen kilos uh, wow. without counter without counterweight. So it's something between uh, the the. A mount from our competitors and the bigger mount, so it might it might seem it might look small, but it can lift a lot a larger payload than our competitors, and and it's also Wi-Fi enabled, um, has lots of other features, and it's uh, it's the more compact travel version of the one one. In okay. the beginning, we we tried to make one one very compact, but we saw that lots of people. They buy a mount and they lots of a lot of heavier equipment, heavier you know, that that the, the mount can support. Yeah. So we we made the version two of the Nix with more with uh, better mechanics to support larger payload, and now we focused in the Nix eighty eight to support a, a small travel tele- telescopes and not only travel telescopes, but it's it is the best uh, size to put it in the small. A suitcase and bring it in in inside an, air, an airplane with your with your telescope. Okay, so so it's sixteen kilos. That's uh, yeah, thirty five pounds. 
right? Which is a lot of headroom, right? For circuit you're traveling, you have a lot of, uh, if you have a small scope, even 102 millimeter refractor, uh, F7 uh, should be able to handle that without any issue, I think. And you still have a lot of headroom on there as well. So you don't run into any capacity problems. You can add all the equipment you need to um, once you load it up with your power box and your focus cube and 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 so on. You have you have lots of uh, extra weight on there. Um, what other things that you have? You have your filter wheel, the Indigo filter wheel. You have the the flat masters that go along with it. So you you guys really offer a broad range of product and accessories for astrophotographers to get uh, an image at sharp, get full control of the entire rig, uh, control the rig with the mount, and then. Uh, um, uh, you complement it with all your other products like the flat master, uh, your own filters, um, high quality cables. Um, what else am I missing here? I'm just, <laughs> I should have made notes, right? You guys have a catalog of, of equipment compared to, I remember a half a page <laughs> on the price originally. Well, a lot of, a lot of adapters that, uh, users are hard to find. Now we focus on the 64 uh, millimeter adapters, uh, especially for people that that have and use uh, full frame cameras. Now they they need the larger aperture adapters. So this was mint M68, 68. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, 668. Yes, uh, the the 64 and 65 are some custom adapters for some for for self focal re reducers and flatteners in the field. Uh, but yeah, we're also working on that. I can say that there, we're trying to cover all the astrophotography uh, products, all of them, uh, one by one, uh, with all the with all the, the the accessories. And now we are, we are I believe we did the, the major leap to work also with cameras, mm -hmm. and we'll I believe we'll discuss about the next product that is was introduced in Tatnif, the Smart Eye, right? Mm -hmm. The Smart Eye, so. I saw the Smart Eye while I was there, and and if anyone was at NEF and looked through the Smart Eye, the demonstra the demonstrating model you had there, I'm sure they were just as astounded and, and impressed and amazed as I was with it. Such an amazing uh, piece of technology and what you guys have done, and still in a compact size y unit. So so let, let's talk about let's talk about the Smart Eye a little bit. How did that come about? You have other collaborators as well that you're working with on that. Um, uh, it seemed to come out of left field. I don't think anyone was really expecting to see this uh, this device at all, right? Um, it was, was a very old idea I had five years ago, but back then we didn't have the, uh, the money and the knowledge, you know, and uh, the hands to to produce and design. I don't believe it was only that. Uh, the technology wasn't ready by that time. And, and the thing is that now technology allows you to use uh, CMOS cameras in astronomy and take very quick exposures. And also, you, you also have now availability of very, very small uh, display uh, monitors that, that are very dense. And you can have 4K in a very small display, uh, so it it should be very eye candy, right? It should be very eye eye candy to 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 the, to the user. So you should have a very nice field of view, a very nice monitor with very dense pixels, and something that can also have very low noise in order to capture color and have a very high quantum efficiency. So this this came only after CMOS and you know in, in modern. Uh, display. So this was an idea, as Ranjit said, lots of years ago. But now we have the uh, the technology that allow that allow that, and that, and we have the knowledge here at Pegasus developing all these products uh, to de to develop and to manufacture such such a product. We met also with the Sky Safari guys. They had also the same idea with us. So we. We proceed with the production of the smart eye together. So they they doing the the software uh, in collaboration with Sky Safari, and uh, we do the electronics and the you know the, the electronics and the enclosure and all the stuff around the the device. Yeah, I know I know it's a pretty interesting product. Um, 
from looking through it. But uh, as a as a retailer myself, I've I've taken a lot of calls from people that are very interested in in the product. When's it coming out? When's it coming out? Um, and I believe you guys are targeting this year. Is that that correct? Not, I, I'm putting you on the spot right now. <laughs> no, no, we we aim we aim to have it available by by the end of the year, and uh, during during Christmas is the correct period. Uh, we are going to we're working in the in the final in the finalize the the device appearance, and we have gotten lots of feedback about people from from people about how the device what the device can offer. If we can add additional features, so we have a roadmap down a large roadmap of features that are, that people you know need. Uh, the first version is gonna is gonna do what it what it uh, what it uh, promises, but down the road, I believe we will we'll have more and more software features, or maybe hard or maybe hardware with with uh, with upgrades. Uh, what of what the device can offer, but it's a very nice device, and you know, you have to see to believe it of what you can see inside the eyepiece and how and how fast you can you can see targets that you would never see before with a small uh, aperture telescope. Are you still planning to come to Starfest? Yeah, there there is a plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are are you, are you going to bring one there that we can we can look for? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Richard also, yeah, one of our one of our uh, team guy is going to be there also, and he has his own uh, um, uh, s- s- smart eye. So we're going to have a demo there about you know about uh, how what you see from the from inside the smart eye. Okay, cool. That'd be really it's really interesting to see. So if you're in the if you're in Ontario or the uh, close to Ontario and you get to Starfest in August. Uh, be sure to come come check that out, uh, August of 2024, um, and uh, Evans will be there. Richard Wright will be there as well. Good. It's always good to see uh, see Richard. Um, but let let let's you know let's talk about some other things. Uh, you have you know a really cool OAG that we were talking about earlier. Um, it's, it solves a uh, a few issues that exist, especially when you're using a rotator. Uh, it's interesting that you showed it to me earlier because just the other day in my shop, I had a customer in there, uh, and we were going through this issue, um, with a uh, rotator and interference with, with a camera. Um, we, we solved the problem by, uh, selling him the, uh, uh, the, this, um, the Pegasus OAG, the existing one, the scopes, um, which had enough clearance on it, uh, as well. So, Hey, that was a win. But what is this new OAG that you have now? It, it has, uh, uh, it, it looks like it's an integrated device overall. We call it uh, Scopes Evo, Evo from Evolution. Uh, it has a motorized, uh, you know, it, it, it can um, uh, focus the, the prism inside. It has two prisms. By the way, this is patent, so... This is the first you you are the first you are listening about it. So it has basically it, it has two prisms with a sensor inside. So you don't need an external camera. Uh, it has a back focus of, of 16 millimeters only. That means it solves the classic problem with the external uh, camera that uh, collides to the rotator. Or any other accessory, so you can uh, bolt it uh, either on the uh, further wheel or the camera directly, and you you can uh, autofocus from Mina or other or, or any other software you like. I, that's really cool. It's a very alpha uh, version of it. It's a three D printed right now, but it works. So we do some testing and we hope to release it in about six months from now. Okay, great. That just uh, I like the idea of, of being able to remotely focus your guide scope um, as a remote imager myself. And I say, when I say remote, I don't mean I've got a, a remote system in the southern hemisphere. I'd love to have that, or or in Arizona, I have a remote system in my backyard. And uh, when in when it's cold in the winter time. I don't want to be going outside. It's time to it's 
when you're changing uh, the filters, the motor uh, does, you know, focus in or focus out, and you don't need to do anything. So we are always in focus in the front gap here. Because it, I have to say it has a triple purpose, not dual. Maybe you can you can focus the Ofax guider. It has integrated camera, so you in the box you get the, a very small uh, Ofax guider, sixteen millimeters, but with an integrated Ofax camera, and the and the size is very small. Your back focus is very small, so you don't have to worry that you know your your camera is going to collide. Uh, with some sort of your equipment because always you put the camera on top of the Ofaxis guider and you need to take care of the back focus and maybe the camera, you need a very small camera, uh, a one and a, 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 a quarter uh, inches camera in order not to collide with your equipment that, you know, that bonds with, uh, with the, with the Ofaxis. So this solves the problem that it's, it's a very slim one with an onboard camera, integrated camera, well, and the, and that's it. You just place it there, and then you can mount. After that, your camera in front, you can mount a, a, a rotator or or whatever you need. So it will definitely help you to uh, to de to decrease your back focus and have everything in place without yeah. buy without buying an extra camera, you know, an extra fix camera. Yeah, that makes it easier to to stick within that that fixed fifty five millimeter. Uh, Backspacing, um, unless you have a Starfield re reducer that, that, that's adjustable, <laughs> so you can make up for that. Um, I had to plug it. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. You guys, you guys are imagers yourself, right? You you guys like to image. You, you have nice equipment. Uh, you go. You guys go out to the mountains um, when the the skies are are good. Um, uh, if, if now let, let's pretend for a minute, let's have some fun. Uh, there's no, we're not going to have any mountains in this scenario, but you're, you're dropped off on a, you're on a deserted Island. It's just you, right. And your camera equipment, and you had to image one target and that's all you can do. You can't do anything else. You can't image anything else. What would that one target be? I think we are. Oh, okay. Okay. Make it, make it easier to make it easier. All right. You, you have you have your computer, you've got your pics in sight. You can process, so we can do one shot color. It depends or on focal length. Focal length. The eye, is the island gonna be over the southern or in the northern hemisphere? Oh, now, <laughs> now you're now you're adding to it. Now you're adding. I I uh, I'm gonna say northern hemisphere because I because I don't know any of the targets really in the southern hemisphere, and um, uh, focal length. You know, something wide field, let's say like five, 500 millimeters. I personally like the 7331 uh, in Pegasus. You know, the one with uh, uh, the Stefan Quindet. Okay. Uh, I like that uh, field of view with a lot of galaxies inside. Basically, I like galaxies and a large focal length. Because uh, the you know the nebulas are very easy to to achieve, so I like uh, to take uh, galaxies to shoot galaxies. So, okay, Evans, one target. Well, for me, Angelus is a galaxy guy. I think I'm a nebula guy. I also like the nebulas, the white field nebulas. So usually, uh, I think the 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 Rosette nebula is one of our of my of my loving targets uh, you know uh, it is it has a lot of information inside that uh, you can use a very a very large uh, focal length and zoom inside the Rosette nebula and seal the structures or use a, a wide field uh, 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 telescope and and get the whole glory of the rosette so I believe it will be the rosette I, li I like the rosette because there's one feature in it that I call the cosmic wrench it looks like a wrench sticking out of it, right? So whenever I see someone posting the the rosette, I always zoom in, circle it, and call it the cosmic wrench. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's another target that comes to mind when you say you can, you can zoom into the rosette and you can get all that detail. Uh, for me, is the Heart Nebula and be able to get into it and get into um, Lloyd 15. And I really like Lloyd 15 too because you could do that in one shot color 
where you can do it in an FHO palette and, and really get a lot of the detail, a lot of structure that's that's coming up. I have to say also that after all these years of astrophotography and now with the evolution of the Simons, that, you know, all these megapixels that we now have, remember uh, five years ago or more, most people they had CMOS cameras with very with very low resolution compared to the CMOS camera. Now we have thirty and fifty, and I don't know how many megapixels if you have a full frame camera. But you can have a very a small refractor, but with the resolution that your camera can achieve, you can zoom in the targets and you know and capture the targets like you had a very smaller uh, rich Acritian telescope. So now now the technology allows you to either use it as a wide field. Or or use or use uh, the resolution of your camera and and have one one zoom and you know focusing the internal structure of its of its faint uh, nebula or some galaxy. So th th that's why I'm telling that the yeah, technology has changed. So it doesn't matter if you have a very very large focal length or a very small now. I believe with the cameras now you you offer we offer to the to the astronomy uh, you can buy. You can you can get uh, either zoom targets and see the structures or wide field targets and you know see how the full glory of the cosmic humans. Yeah, no, I I agree that the change the rapid change in technology, right? Because it was wasn't too long ago that I think that the sensor that really kind of changed things up was that the um, the Panasonic uh, sixteen megapixel sensor when when that came out. And it was low, relatively low cost. Um, it performed well, very well. I think it was only twelve bit, um, uh, and it it changed. I think it really changed the landscape for uh, for everyone because now you can get into an affordable camera and um, really push forward. And what was interesting with that was everything else that came after it, um, the peripheral devices, right? So now we saw filter wheels that were less expensive. We started to see real limitations on some of the filters that existed and it pushed filter manufacturers to produce better filters. So we weren't getting the haloing that we saw in, in some band, especially around 03, right? Um, especially if you had a, uh, a faster optics uh, scope, you're down like F4 and below, right? Um, uh, so it was interesting to see how that pushed forward. And then it kind of just took off from there, right? And, and really, I, th I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that's around this, the same time that you guys really came into the market too and be, and became part of that that revitalization of the hobby where, where a new generation were coming in. Um, the technology that you were offering was latched onto by uh, new imagers and, and existing imagers. And then it it really helped flourish the, the hobby, right? So I think what you guys did and what you guys brought in was was perfectly timed and and, and uh, helped propel the the hobby forward. Does that sound like a fair assessment to you guys? And, right. And the sky and the sky is the limit. There are lots of good ideas that uh, need to be explored. Uh, I believe uh, we don't have lots of the the time we need. We have lots of ideas. I believe we're gonna also offer lots of competitive, innovative products in the nearest future. As, I mean, I'm talking about the Spegel Sostry, but also in the market, I have seen lots of great ideas and lots of things that are evolved and they are going to be offered to the customers. Uh, where in, um, I can say that half a decade ago or a decade ago, you didn't have them and you were struggling to make a good picture with lots of, you know, lots of uh, manual work now where everything is automated. Yeah, well, especially with the advent, with the advent of AI uh, being brought into a lot of the processes, or the I should I don't know if it's necessarily AI, the term AI, and, and well, there's probably some some AI there uh, to make processing a lot easier uh, for for astrophotographers. Uh, I've always maintained this, um, where now the the technology, the soft on the software side has caught up right to the really high-end hardware right i'm talking like the, the you know, think like takahashi and asa and and so on right those really high-end guys that you're going to get some fantastic data through their through their equipment 
But now you can have modest equipment and still have a very good result with with these advancements on the software side. Exactly. This is one of a uh, of, uh, thing that we are continuously discuss uh, all these uh, all these months that with modest equipment uh, now you can get uh, eight photos and fix and correct optical error, errors that it what it, it was impossible in the past to fix them or, or it was requiring a lot of processing in Photoshop. Yeah, I uh, I. I... I feel sorry for um, the judges of astrophotography contests now because I think their job got a lot harder. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. Right. But it's good. I think it's good for the uh, good for the hobby because now now it it, it allows um, modest hardware. I don't think it. I I've, I've used the term modest hardware, but I think it it it's not inexpensive and, and low quality hardware, uh, uh, equ equipment, but it, it, uh, compared to some of the really high end stuff guys where it, you know, $10,000 for a scope versus $3,000 for the same aperture scope. Um, and I think that now this, the, uh, this opens up a lot of, uh, possibilities in, in, in the hobby as well, where, you know, those really high end guys can start bringing their prices down because you know they need to be competitive to try to capture that market. The difference between those scopes are just a one click in Photoshop or Pixinsight. Yeah, well, that's just it, right? Because if now if 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 you can have we'll get use the term modest hardware or modest equipment again, and, and get a fantastic image that you would get with a ten thousand dollar scope and a five thousand dollar camera and so on, like so, you're gonna have like twenty thousand dollars worth of gear, right? And you might have a, a really expensive mount, but if you can correct all of that with, like we said, Angel, it's a click of a button, right? Then why have that? So those guys either need to, you know, match the the market a little bit more, or this is where it gets exciting for me. I think, right? They can push the envelope again on the hardware side and come out with with something even greater to give back to the um, to the community, to the industry. Right, that advances things forward, and then we can start catching things up. And that's where I, th where I see, you know, a company like yourself, Pegasus, where like, okay, great, we have this new stuff that we can play with, right? And how can we make products to better things altogether? So I think it, the whole AI introduction to the hobby is just to help drive, can help really drive things forward to develop better equipment and the better experience. We need now to find something that it's going to cover uh, the telescope after the night. And that's it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> if it can cover the hood also, wear the hood to the telescope, that would be great also. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today on the podcast. Thank you for joining. Evans, I look forward to seeing you again. At, uh, at Starfest. Angelus, are you going to be joining us at Starfest this year? Yeah, we're not. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Now it's a party. <laughs> now it's a party, right? And he's even smiling too. <laughs> I think that we have so many things to produce and make and we pushed from everyone, from our dealers, from our customers to make things and I, you know, I'm very anxious about all of this stuff, so no. <laughs> that's why I'm not smiling. <laughs> oh, if anyone, if anyone knew the inside joke that that that's there between Angelus and I, they they probably <laughs> understand why I'm always saying he's he's smiling or asking what he is. Um, no, I love you guys. You guys are great. Uh, I consider you guys friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the. Ask the podcast. Uh, make sure if you're watching this, you can also listen to us on the audio side as well. If you're listening to it on the audio, make sure you check out our channels um, and YouTube channel, and you can watch it um, and see all the all the cool action and the demonstration of of the OAG that Angelus had as well. When, when that's ready, I want one. Just, just okay. <laughs>